G'day guys, what's up? Welcome to another special episode of the podcast and today we have on Ben Kelly and he is an absolute legend. I'm so happy to actually connect with this guy. He helps people in terms of coaching with body, food, relationships and so much other stuff. He takes this like real big holistic approach, sort of like myself in regards to how he actually helps people. He's developing a really awesome course. He's been traveling all around the world. He's been living in Bali. He's, I think he, he was currently in Barcelona when we had a chat. So he's been doing all this crazy stuff. And man, we got to have an extremely good conversation on masculinity, relationships, and how us as guys can actually bring our emotions into something. And the the conversation was fantastic. I'm so happy we went and dove down the, the tangent that we did, as I find it is so beneficial and it's a conversation that not many of us have. So whether you're a guy or a girl, please listen to the full episode because it gets quite vulnerable, to be honest. We get quite vulnerable and it's all, really awesome to listen to and it was just great to have a chat with someone um, exactly like him, which was just fantastic. So before we actually start the podcast, just a couple of things really quickly. So as you probably listened to the start of the podcast, I do have some coaching spaces available, part-time, full-time, and also community coaching. So just go to my website, coreyboutwell.com and follow the prompts if you're interested in those. I also have a recipe ebook that I sell, which is, I find is absolutely ridiculous. There's so much value in that thing, purely because I have done all the research, all of my articles that I've researched on the website, coreyboutwell.com, all of the ingredient shopping list articles, I essentially research all of the best ingredients possible. And then I figured out how to put them into something extremely tasty in certain sequences for meals, as far as meal prep goes, as far as making potions with your bone broth, as far as like actual making really tasty meals to impress someone. And they're all like really quick, easy, tasty. And like the best part is they're super nutritious, like super nutritious. So I highly recommend you get that. The link is down below. And also, as always, this podcast is brought to you by Eternum Labs. And if you guys haven't got any of the Eternum Labs products, I extremely recommend you to go out there. So the main mission of Eternum Labs is literally to support you as best as possible nutritionally to get you in the best energy, the best recovery and the high performance as you can. And we have multiple different products on there. We have sleep products. We have help you get into the zone products. We have energy products. There's vitamins. We've got lion's mane, mushroom, and we have a whole bunch of stuff that is just like awesome, awesome goods in there. So I highly recommend you actually go in there, check that out. And you can use the code Corey to get yourself a 10% off discount on there, which I think is quite fantastic. So I hope you guys enjoy this podcast as much as I did. And I just hope you also have the best day wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And thank you for choosing to be the best version of yourself. And thank you for choosing to listen to this podcast. If you also wouldn't mind, just real quickly, if you get any value from any of this stuff, or you like my podcast, or you like any of the messages that we're sharing, or if you get any little bit of value from this, please share it. Please just share it onto your story on Instagram. Hit that little square button with the arrow up. Click share really quickly, even now if you like, just real quickly, just jump on, click share, share in your story, and then like and subscribe. And if you haven't already and you listen to an Apple Podcasts, I would extremely appreciate, like really, really, really deeply appreciate a review because they go really far. And currently, if you guys don't know, this podcast has just got up to like a number 180 in Australia in the health and fitness category, and we want to make it up to number one. So literally, you by by sharing, liking, subscribing, leaving the reviews, doing all of those things will help us get this podcast up as high as possible and reach as many people as possible, and we'll be making a huge impact. So thank you so much for doing that if you do. And yes, guys, crush your day, enjoy this podcast, and we'll see you in the next one. Ben, thanks so much for coming onto the show, man. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, all good. Just as like a little quick question, man, what are you currently working on at the moment? I know that you've obviously been doing some work in Bali and now you're, as we we're just talking about beforehand, you're like across, across the world <laughs> managing somehow to like get through all of the different crazy travels. Um, so what are you currently um, working on and, and focusing on? Yeah, so um, right now, and this has been a hard thing over the time for me is like I've had so many different interests that um, it's been tough for me to like just center in on like a niche, you know, obviously like having a niche and things have like always been super important, like for business and like online and all that sort of stuff. But I found myself having just so many interests because I just think, you know, 
so much relates to it, it, each other so much um kind of touches you know something else in some other area of your life so um right now i'm focusing on creating a course around um sort of women healing their relationship around their food and their body i think one of the big perks uh, big things around if i look back at my journey um it's it's not been as much around it's obviously been hugely beneficial like having having you know eating plan and a diet plan all those sorts of things but i think the things that made them work well was my my mentality and my relationship to them that ultimately had them uh be fruitful over the long term so when i'm you know i've been looking at that so well what separated for me to anyone else that gets given it you know, any sort of plan or any, any sort of workout, any sort of diet. It's the way that I've had my relationship to what I'm doing. And so for me, I'm focusing heav heavily in that, but also, you know, working towards, you know, reframing a lot of stuff around relationships, um, you know, obviously around food and body, um, around exercise, all those sorts of things and trying to find obscure, um, you know, sources of people's, discomfort in these areas that are maybe not typical. So sort of scouring the earth for a little bit, the more obsolete and seeing if there's any sort of connection that may, may be missing that isn't quite prevalent. So yeah, trying to plug those holes. Yeah. Have you found anything yet? That's like been interesting. That's sort of a little bit stand out. Oh, look every day, man, every day. It's like, the funny thing is like, I'm always just having my theories proven wrong, like often or, 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 yeah. or finding like something that um, completely shifts my perspective. Um, you know, as I've been putting this course together, um, so much of what I'm realizing around people's relationship to their bodies, to exercise, to food, um, you know, it never, it like almost never has anything to do with the, you know, the food itself or the body itself or, or whatever. Right. And uh, it's, it's just lots of little different things and, and hungers and needs that people have within their life or the skills that they need to develop that once they unlock, you know, really um, has a great flow um, of change come into life in an area that they never, you know, looked in, you know, it's like, it's so easy to pinpoint, you know what, Oh, you know, I'm fat or this or that, the, the solution is, um, go and work out, go and do this, go and do that, right? When it's like, it could be something that's completely off to the, off to the left that was tucked away in, into the, you know, the darkness that was never even thought of that if gets attended to just unlocks everything. So um, it's finding those, those, those harder to see sorts of things. And obviously that takes time, takes a lot of research and a lot of trying to find, um, connections between um things that maybe have been harder to see so um a lot of that has got to do with you know obviously people's relationships to the you know their masculine and the feminine and things like that and you know a lot of people might hear that and i'm not the most ultra woo woo person so anytime i i say something there's sort of a there's there's a bit of masculine energy behind it where there's still even if, if it's woo woo i found i found where it's i feel it was legitimate logically wise and rationally wise <laughs> so um uh, a lot of those areas that are sort of dismissed as airy fairy, actually, when we when we look at them, um, do have a big impact on a lot of um, ways that people relate to, you know, people relate to, relate to body, relate to food, relate to you know everything. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Because it, it also like with that is you have to really start, I believe, looking like inwards to start finding out those things. Because as you mentioned, it's not just one thing; it could be multiple different things, and it could be something. A little bit woohoo but it's not until you actually go down and really like think about the things personally and interpersonally and start like diving around in your own mind or figuring out some stuff that's happened in the past or whatever it is where you sort of will find a trigger or something where it's like ah and that's why that happens <laughs> or something like that which can usually lead to some sort of uh, as you'd say i don't know for a lack of a better word, just in my perspective, like a, like a food addiction or some sort of other addiction that you'd have mentally to something mm. that you're, you're project, projecting on yourself or something else. And we, I mean, we see that. We see that everywhere. I mean, everyone's got their cruxes. Every, every, everyone's got their medicators. You know, everyone's got their things that they find difficult of which they try to, you know, self-soothe from. Um, 
you know, and even just with a lot of this work is like being able to find out where, you know, correlates and relates to me. Um, you know, there's the, the funny thing is that like with a lot of growth and there's a lot of red herrings, like red herrings are basically things that just like distract. It's almost like, you know, those, um, uh, you know, those stories of like the who did it, like the who did it stories where it's like, um, oh, it was the butler or it was the maid who, who killed Mrs. Yeah. Bottomsworth. It was yeah. the, right. And it's like, we've got so many people like, and it's in the movies, you know, in the movies where it's like, oh, it's like CSI. So it's like, oh, it's got to be, that's the perpetrator. That's the one that's done. And when really it was, you find out later on down the track is this, this over here and you had no idea. It took you by surprise. Yeah. Right. And it's like, so how do I find, and again, the red herrings and the things that distract us are like, we, we, cause we have such a difficult um, time finding solutions to complex um, questions we find simple answers in things that we we seem to be obvious oh i'm just obsessive about food therefore it's like that's the end oh it's the kardashians fault that i have a poor body image right it's yeah. you know it's like how do we create these things where we think we gain a solution or we we know the source of the issue when really that that thing that we think is a source is distracting us from discovering what it really is so you know and, and there's so many, oh, with this work, it's like, there's so many things that relate to each other and the, the different types of medicaids. Like I've spoken in the past about, I used to medicate a lot through um, or self-soothe or distract um, from difficult emotions with sex. You know, I was probably borderline sex addict, uh, sex addict at one point. Um, I think that's fairly growing. Um, I feel, I feel like that's fairly growing, especially in this day and age where accessibility is, 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 you know, on the rise. Um, I used to do it in that way. Right. And it's like, so, so many of the things or so many of the reasons of which I was medicating or distracting or self soothing in that, in relation to that was the same reason as a lot of people self soothe through completely different things. So um, it's been, it's been awesome to be able to, um, find those connections and be able to empathize with people that maybe medicate in ways that are different, uh, different, different than myself. Yeah. And how, how did you get like onto this path? Like what kind of led you to dive down and really start to reflect onto this stuff and really like learn it, apply it and start to take off with it? Yeah. So, um, I've, I've been, uh, heavily involved in network marketing over the last 10 years. That's where I've made a majority of my money. Um, and so a big part of network marketing is obviously you, you uh, is, is investment to, um, personal development. I'm fortunate enough, you know, my company was hugely invested into the growth of the people. So the amount of events and things that they put on was, and that was my, one of my first forays into actual personal development. I, I've had a very fixed mindset. I thought, you know, you, you these are the cards you've been dealt. Um, you just got to make the most of them. Right. I, I had no sort of think I, I didn't know even personal development or self-help or any of that sort of thing was was a thing i didn't yeah. know right this was in my mid this is in my mid-20s mind you so it's not like i was picking this up at like a really early age and um from there i i i, I at that point i was very depressed i had like a really detrimental mindset i had low self-worth all these things um found myself feeling like i was in a body that wasn't mine and in a life that wasn't meant for me um, feeling a real, you know, incongruency with what I felt like my potential was and where I was actually sitting. And that was very, that, that was painful. And so I delved into that world and realized there was so many things that I didn't know were things to know. And when I, you know, found new perspectives that completely shifted the way I looked on one thing, I was like, well, how much else don't I know? Like, it was almost like trying to find out how little I knew. I think people kind of do this stuff so it's like they can they can become intelligent. It's like that's obviously a trap because if you, if you get to a point where you think you're super intelligent, your curiosity starts to wane because you're identified with being a hugely intelligent person. But I think over the time I've just been like, how little do I know? And that sort of curiosity has been what's pushed me along because I've known oh, it only takes one or two things that – to just really spark huge change. And as long as you're staying curious, you know, those things will show up. 
and then obviously I just I fell in love with it. Um, I made huge changes within my life within a relatively short amount of time. Um, you know, uh, helped my mum out. We retired our mum. Um, you know, I was able, you know, give us some time back um, for you know raising four kids as a single mum. And people want to know more about that story. And then I started to sort of, you know, teach what happened in between the in between points of like from here to there. And um, it was from that starting to go into the teaching realm that obviously, you know, I always said to people, it's like your job is to out is to outgrow me and to make me redundant. And my job is to make sure that that never happens. And I still have value in your life. And um, that's just what's kept me accountable to just consistently keeping learning and keeping um, passing on what it is I'm learning about myself more than anything. Yeah, dude, I love that. And I love how you mentioned like, obviously keeping curious was key, but also you, you mentioned a couple of times, which have just like triggered my mind. It's just that you keep talking about, or you've mentioned a few times, just the impact that your body had on yourself. And I was just thinking that as you were saying, I was like, man, everyone, everyone, everyone cares about their body and they care about what it looks like and they care about how it actually performs. Even if they've let go (laughs) and they're self-soothing somewhere, they still care about it. So what was like your experience of um, getting your body back into shape and like improving your relationship with with your body yeah i mean like i um so i played i played semi-professional football yep soccer um, for anyone back in australia that does want to call football <laughs> um or in the States. <laughs> right so um after i finished that up i i i just i was always training in the gym and everything like that but i just i needed different goals i did i needed different focuses and um, I was always, uh, you know, obviously very logically and rationally minded. Um, I trained because it was just, I, you know, I had regimen and it just became a habit is what I did. Um, I, saw, I sought out um, experts to sort of help me with my program and everything like that. I learned a whole bunch from that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I loved the idea of, you know, a lot of people look at a lot of people in the fitness industry or like, you know, change your body composition and, and think, oh, it's all vain and everything. But there's a, there's a huge amount of intellect that goes into being able to, you know, for a man to put on muscle without having to blow out all the time. And um, I found that fascinating. And, you know, it, it was, it was like, it was just like sculpting. It's just like, this is a, this is a, a reference point of where my head's at. And obviously that's not the case all the time. I mean, that was, was where I was at, but you know, it got to a point where um, you, you're reaching the upper echelons of sort of where you can take your, your body naturally. And a lot of guys sort of fall in, you know, you know, like the, for, for the industry, it's like, okay, um, now I need to maybe seek um, uh, enhances or whatnot. And that was a real sort of point where it's like, you know, okay, where am, where do I, where do my goal sit with this now? Where, where am I willing to take it to? And then obviously then I was like, I, I, I felt like with that aspect, you know, learning about, you know, change your body and the body composition and all that has been like hugely beneficial to me. Um, I never ended up to be fair, like a lot of guys, and again, I wasn't like bodybuilding. It's completely different. You you, you got to separate yourself from those that are committed to to um, co- competing. You know, um, if you're and instead of just someone that's looking to change their body composition, right? Um, even a lot of guys that aren't competing are like, you know, developing, you know, muscle dysmorphia, and it's just like they're never big enough. <laughs> Um, right? like they, like there's guys that look at themselves and they're, they're incredibly huge guys, but they just see this skinny little thing. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I like I've, my, my goals have moved a little bit. Um, they're more focused around like functionality and mobility and things that I've neglected in the past because my focus wasn't, had nothing to, to really care about that sort of stuff. And as I get older, that's becoming more of a priority. Longevity is becoming more of a priority. And sometimes I look back at like when I was maybe like you know, eight kilos heavier than what I am now, seven kilos heavier than what I am. And back then I still, there was a part of me that looked at that and was like, 
your time. <laughs> like I, I really felt like I had a long way to go there, right? <laughs> and um, the, the 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 one thing though is like it didn't impact my like social life that much. I could go out with friends and be social, um, you know, all those sorts of things. I don't think I developed muscle dysmorphia, but now looking back, I could definitely see how it, it develops in other people. And um, there was definitely times where I was hugely regimented and, and didn't drink and didn't do all those things. And that was obviously required, but um, it's, it's just, it's always a continual, you know, journey, like with health, I can't not be. And again, it's all trial and error, isn't it? Everything's just trial and error. I mean, it, you, you take two people, you take a hundred people that have got incredible, feel, incredible health and ask them how they've gotten there. And they could probably give you a thousand different ways. Some things will be obviously very consistent. But there'll be little tweaks and things that are you know, very different through trial and error that have worked well for their body. And that's the big thing is like, everyone's just got to really have, go through a long journey of trial and error with their own their own body and the intricacies of their own body. And I think, you know, that's obviously something that I continue to learn more about. Um, but yeah, it, it did get to a point where it's just like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't shooting for contests or anything. It was just like, just get big and lean. It was just like, <laughs> just get big and lean. Yeah. What for? Yeah. There was, it was just like, There's no reason. <laughs> Well, no, like thinking about it, it was just like, again, it just became habit. That's what I did. But I, I think I got to a point where I was just really satisfied with what I did. Nice. And that was a good thing. I actually arrived at the point where I was like, you know what? And, and, it, and, you know, as I've, I've paid attention to, as I'm not training the same as what I did for like, you know, eight, nine, 10 year span of time, which was hard to shift. Um, think like the things that like, oh, I dropped below 90 and I was like, oh my God, there was something in my brain that was like, you can't be below nine. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It was just looking at that number. It was just like it represented, like it just represented a huge turning of the tide. And it was just like, it made me, it, it, like it, it did stir some stuff, right? It was like, fuck, I need to eat more. That was, that was, <laughs> like, I'm not eating enough. But I was like, my goals weren't even to go and get big anymore. But I was still sort of like, att like attached to that sort of thing, right? And I've had to kind of, nurture my relationship to being okay with like sitting naturally at like, you know, 88, 89. If the time ever comes again, where I, I feel like that's a goal that I want to have, I want to go at, then amazing. Yeah, for sure. So what do you think like personally over the past, I'd say recent year, two years, what do you think are some of the biggest lessons that you have learned in terms of just whatever's been happening over the past couple of years? You've just been like, oh my God. I can't believe that I've just learned this now <laughs> that have had a really good impact to you. Oh, damn. Look, I've been learning a lot about, I mean, my biggest struggle, like, I, I, like obviously the, the things you're going to learn most about, I was still going to be in ref, in reflection to your, your, the things you struggle with the most. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I've had, Difficulties with intimacy. Yep. Um, a lot of difficulties, difficulties in certain ways. In some ways, not so much. In, in some other ways, um, which has caused a lot of um, the most amount of uh, feelings of uncomfortableness to to seep through through doing the work. Mm -hmm. Right. Some of the other work doesn't. I have a, I have epiphanies, and they're amazing, but they're not them not making me uncomfortable or like, and, and I can pay attention to sometimes when that's happening because I'll go and resort to like joking or laughing. I just start laughing for no reason. It's like I need to kind of distract myself. I'm like, and I'm paying attention to these things and doing intimacy work with my, with my partner has um, brought up questions to answers that I had, I had no answers for. Hmm. And that was something that was really weird for, weird for me that that was simple questions and I didn't have an answer for them and, or I never contemplated them. And over the time I realized, you know, maybe my relationship to sex was a bit distorted. Um, you know, I was single for seven years um, before I got into my relationship. Um, we, I mean, we 
we live in a Australia is quite hyper masculine. Um, Agreed. I feel, and and that's developed a lot of incredible traits. I, you know, I feel a lot of a lot of great character, a lot of, a lot of great traits in ways. Um, but Laura equilibrium, not so much in some ways. Yeah. You know, and I think you know a lot of Australian men's relationship to uh, emotions uh, themselves intimacy sex um in a lot of ways are very distorted yeah well i think so thing i don't know i don't know if that's anything that you've been in uh, you know you've found with yourself or any of your friends around you but i, oh, I found man. that big time like huge i wouldn't say like um huge problem i was gonna say but it's like a huge topic that's like super interesting and i think that comes into um what we're talking about beforehand is people find or us may find distraction through body image (laughs) a lot of the time i think that can happen but yeah man um i I really agree um australia does seem to be hyper masculine and obviously as you mentioned law of equilibrium does happen and we get caught up and guys can be disconnected and like they sort out danger distraction or something else to just get their mind away from whatever it is. And then when it comes to, as you're mentioning, like an intimate relationship, they find it extremely hard. I know I've found it extremely hard to actually be intimate. (laughs) So what are some of the things, because I'm like extremely curious to know, like what are some of the things that have brought you most fulfillment through like doing some intimacy work? And what what are some of the things that you have done um, with the work? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, obviously having a look back at you know my past and, and why um maybe i am the way i am um you know from a young age uh man of the family uh lived in an area that maybe wasn't the safest um you know single mum, three younger sisters from really early age um people's living circumstances you know will dictate a lot of the character that they're forced to develop right i found myself in a position where I was forced to develop, um, you know, sort of putting my emotions off to the side in service of something. And I saw my purpose as being, you know, obviously the protector of the family, yeah. e- even really, really young. That's what you're, I remember sitting there when I was younger and praying being like, and I remember the, I said it every day. It's like, dear God, if you have to take someone, please take me, allow my family to have, you know, a long, loving, fulfilling, happy, successful life. And if, if any, any, anyone has to go, be me. And I did that at a young age. There was some part of, of my identity. Got- <laughs> well, well, yeah. And, 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 you know, the funny thing is, what is that I remember, and I wrote about this not long ago. I remember like, this is a contrast is that my mom was at the front of the house and a man was just scr- like screaming at it, screaming at it. And I remember peeping out the window as like a real young kid and and I so I ran to the to the kitchen. I grabbed the biggest knife I could. I put it behind my back and I walked out and I stood next to her. And then eventually, you know, obviously the guy went away. And I didn't think twice about that. But then there would be a, a, a girl that lived down the street who would come to the house, knock on the door to come and see me, and I'd run away. Mm. And my, I'd, t- I'd tell my sisters to go and tell her that I'm not home. So on one instance, I could without without any thought go and put myself in that situation but the that connectivity and that in that that uh, you know relationship to women that was was horrible horrifying i think and and obviously so over the time i i developed um character that had to suit my environment it made me a little bit you know hard like harder skinned it meant that emotions were not in service of of your objective of my purpose, it got in the way. I didn't want to have too much love in my life because having more love in my life represented burden, it represented weight. Like a, a lot of men in Australia find themselves in very similar situations where, you know, their love is not free. Their love is, 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 has responsibility. Their love has, has weight. Right. And yeah. it, it, it wanting more of it makes them more vulnerable Right. And it's not even that I wanted to be in that situation or have to do those things. It was just that that's what I what I felt like was demanded of me, given my circumstances. 
but I ended up like it, it, it really sort of, uh, I guess made me not want to have deeper connections with anyone else. Cause that meant more responsibility and that more meant more burden. If something happened to you, that's more on me. And yeah. I just didn't want to have more room for anyone. Um, because the fear of what would happen to my family, like, was 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 crippling. It worried yeah. me every day. And to invite more of that into my life, it didn't it didn't it didn't mean a lot of the same things as what it meant to a lot of people. It didn't mean like joy. It didn't mean like it meant fear. It meant responsibility. It carried a weight. It had burden attached to it. So that obviously, you know, gets taken into um adult life i think you know with we're coming through like if you think about the ways that we we spoke about sex like growing up if you went out in a night in a town and you spoke to your boys about oh yeah it was disgusting like, <laughs> we talked about it was oh, disgusting well <laughs> well it was very surface it was like yeah. it was just a it was just a matter of it happening yeah that was all that it, it didn't matter the quality it didn't matter the, the connection didn't matter depth. It was just the, it was just the fact that you, 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 you did it. That was yep. all it was. It was very goal orientated. It was very like, you know, um, I achieved, um, yeah. ejaculate goal yeah. achieved. I carried on my life. Right. And it's like, then you, you go into adulthood and, and we live in a time now where, where women rely on men less for a lot of things. And because they rely on us less for a lot of things, they're now demanding more in other ways that men are not well equipped. Yeah. Right. And we're so and, not equipped. So like, <laughs> what more depth? And it's like, and then this is why men are like having a real, this is why women, you know, um, uh, are really not satisfied because a lot of times back in the day, relationships were more of a like, in, economical thing or just an yeah. easy thing to progress you know, the safety of the family or like the continuation of you know your genes to yeah. be able to just like the roles were very different yeah. what they required from their partners was very different um and in this day and age what people and especially women are wanting are very different we've never had such a massive swing in changing of circumstances and dynamics than we have within the last 20 years and oh, i think crazy my generation like the 25 to, to 40 find themselves in this pre-internet sort of phase and this post-internet phase where they have the ide ideologies of their parents and their grandparents that you know held up very true and relevant in a time that no longer exists and now they've got the dynamics of a world that is over here that now they're entering into of and they're in this middle ground of knowing both and being able to work out what the dynamics of relationships looks like and trying to redefine them for ourselves where where no one has been able to before and it's <laughs> and right and it's a new language so, man we're losing we're you're learning like relationship chinese or something <laughs> yeah well, we're having to work it out yeah well well we're the, the games, the rules of the rules, are, a lot of the rules have changed. Again, yep. a lot of the, the ideologies of which we subscribe to in a, in a different time, um, some of them are no longer relevant. And I think a lot of people are having a hard time shifting with that. They're, they're really trying to keep a, a, like every, obviously a lot of ideologies and a lot of values um, are still hugely relevant, but there's a few that really are warping people's expectations of, of, of how a relationship should be in this day and age given the fact that a lot of circumstances have changed within a really short amount of time. And I think people are really having a hard time um, uh, keeping up and, you know, they're, they're stuck in a time that no longer exists and trying to make what maybe worked in the past work now. And it just um, doesn't. And that's hugely relevant for, you know, why we're seeing women demand more, in terms of uh, their desires for more intimacy and more depth yeah. is because um, they seek more security, less security in men. They, they making their own money. They're doing all these things. Yeah. And now it's like, yeah, think, more than the table. Yeah. I think sort of like, so they should, to be honest, because in, in terms of like us as guys, as men, as being like, 
I don't know about you, but when I grew up, I always look at like superheroes. I looked at the best leaders. I looked at people who were impacting the world. I'd look at who would be the best father figures. I'd look at who would be in the best relationships. And I always thought like, I want to be the ultimate across all of those different things. And I want to be like that hero type of person. And through some of the stuff that I've researched and that um, I've listened to and that I've read on, and especially in terms of relationship stuff, because I have had a lot to learn with some of my past relationships for sure, and I'm still learning like crazy. But one of the things that I think is super, super important is one is the different like communication between like men and women. And the second one is that how how are us as men supposed to grow and develop as best as possible and be like the best version of ourselves if we're not challenged as hard as possible? Because I think one, one of the beautiful things about like masculinity and like sacred, you can say the sacred masculinity is when challenges come, we get to try and overcome them. However, as you mentioned beforehand, obviously, (laughs) We have some work to do in terms of like ourselves interpersonally because communication and intimacy and talking about emotions as like you sharing with your story, you were getting into a knife fight so much easier than what it was just talking to a girl, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, so I was petrified. Of, yeah, petrified. How scary is it? And I was like, what's harder? So we're ready to go out and crush something physical like this. But when it comes to something emotional, especially with Australians, we'll like cower and hide under the table. And it's like, if we're going to be the best, we need to be pushing ourselves in all areas. And this may be the scariest, but this is what's going to force us to grow in the best way possible. And shout out to one of my friends, Glenn Money, because one of the things that he always said um, to me, which really resonated was he used to say, well, what he says frequently is he's like, a relationship is you're in a constant ceremony, man, like a plant ceremony or something. Like you're just in a constant ceremony the whole time. Like you're doing the work, just being in a relationship. And I'm like, so true. Thanks for that wisdom, bro. (laughs) Yeah, Glenn's a solid one. Glenn's a solid one. Shout out out to Glenn. Yeah. Um, Yeah, man. I mean, uh, again, like that's the thing. It's like, like I'm very good at like, like verbalizing um, my thoughts and feelings. But like, again, like, and there's been times where it's like, oh, you're so in touch with the feminist. Like, no, no, no. I'm rationalizing my emotions. <laughs> like, I'm not feeling into them, right? It's like the feminine is obviously, is the feeling into things. And the masculine is obviously, you know, if I'm sharing my thoughts and feelings and in, in a very logical manner, I'm still, I'm still in my masculine. But again, that's been the massive thing is, is having really difficult and, and open conversations about where I am at. And, and, and again, like I've, my partner is super, com- super comfortable with intimacy. Um, so I've been planted with someone that has been presented to me to really, to, to really, te- yeah, to really test me. And it's like, that's what relationships are. They're both support and challenge. I honestly, I think, you know, maybe 70% should be support and 30% should be challenges. Like there's, there's been times where we've said to each other and she said, you know, uh, I'd be, things would feel easier if we were single. And it's like, yeah, but is there so much more growth in us? The answer was always yes. So, um, you know, obviously you're going to have those thoughts run through your head and you give them as much validation as you want. Um, for a lot of mine, I don't. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't own a, own a lot of them. I let them do the thing, but um, it's, yeah, you know, but, but with this sort of what has been the most, like I've sat there and felt so uncomfortable <laughs> uh, and with some things that people would find really, really difficult that would make them scream, uh, like scream, like very different. Right. And again, like we've all got all these different sets of lived experiences that we've got to be able to sort of, you know, unravel and have a, have a bit, bit of curiosity around and, and have a look at. And with that area for me, um, it's, it's, it, and again, it's required having a very patient partner at the same time. Mm. Um, and someone that trusts my willingness to want to learn and to uh, want to grow in that area, regardless of how much resistance comes up in my body um, towards it and how much, sometimes I want to try and push it into the darkness because again, I, I want to go and, you know, uh, move myself away from it. But 
that's an area of growth that I want to step into, um, obviously because it's very healing, but at the same time, um, it's important for me in, in my relationships, not even just my, my relationship with my girlfriend, but just my relationships with other people. Um, have you got a story? You know, by so, the way? Have you got any stories that you could share in regards to into that and like getting uncomfortable and having to like work through it with your partner? We've been like, well, uh, we, we, so there was one, one, one thing we were doing was we're doing a, um, an intimacy course together. Nice. And, um, like, and there's been times where I've been at like events and they do that, you know, you stand in front of a stranger and you look at them yeah. and it's like, <laughs> what I'll do, what, <laughs> what I'll do is I'll go and, I'll be looking at them, but I've just locked on them and I'm, I'm looking around with my peripheries. Yeah. So right, I'm look, like, I'm, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's like, I'm looking at you and I'm locked in, but I've logically gone, yeah, just lock your eyes in there and just like, just drift off somewhere else. And like, <laughs> so I can do the exercises, but I'm not doing them in the ways in which they're intended, right? Yeah. Um, so, so eye gazing's tough, man. We'll, Ah, oh, yeah, it, and that's the funny thing. I could do it, but I like I kind of like skirt, skirt it around it. But um, but that, that's not what I'm referring to. But yeah, we 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 had a bunch of questions come up, and I can't even remember what they were, but they were like around sex and and they were really and 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 the answers came to her with with such ease, right? And she's so comf and 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 there would be questions that came up that. I'm like, I can't believe I've never even thought of this. And kind of like a part of me was a bit embarrassed, hmm. right? It, I was, I, it was a part of me that was a little bit embarrassed. I was just like, God, I have no answer for this. And this is such a simple, it's such a simple question. Can you think and of any of the like, questions? Something could, oh, roughly what it was like? Honestly, oh, It was like, like, how do you like to be touched? Oh, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. What what, how, what makes you feel? What what makes you feel the best when you feel? And I was like, Shit. I don't know. <laughs> where where do you like to be touched on your body? And like, it wasn't about like, you know, oh my dick, you know, <laughs> like yeah. fuck it. Yeah. It was like. And I had to sit there and think about it. And we had to do all these other exercises. And I just felt myself squeaming, like, just like the child in me. And also, like, I think about, like, certain, like, simple things back in the day that impacted the way that, you know, I have around intimacy and in my relationship to, like, sex and stuff. And it was like, I had a friend who had an older sister. And she was much older, um, like, in, in, a, in a period of time where she could, um, was comfortable with sex and sexuality. And she would sing to me to try and make me uncomfortable in front of everyone. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's yeah. talk about you and me. Right. She'd sing that to me and I'd cringe. <laughs> and then and it's like, I look back at that and I'm like trying to decipher, like going to the deep depths of like my, my life and like where certain little things that maybe took up three seconds of time maybe affected me. It's like, you know, her embarrassing me in front of everyone in that way really kind of maybe had more longer lasting effects. Maybe I gave, I gave validation to, you know, and it's like these tiny little things that just seep back into your unconscious. That's like sort of go unnoticed and you're like, you know, maybe that had, maybe that had more, more weight than what, than what I thought. So yeah, there's been, and, and we're like, there's been improvement, but there's been times where it's just like, it didn't seem like I was moving yeah. and it was frustrating for my girlfriend. And I, I you know, it's just, you know, and, and hoping that she, she is patient enough for me to get over the hill. Um, but we, you know, we've, we've read and watched so many things together and, and done that as a process. We've read the same books. Um, we've spoken to um, different people about, you know, their experiences and everything like that. And um, it's not it's not an easy it's not something that just shifts in a quick amount of time. Oh yeah. Um, so 
it's, it's, it's still very much ongoing. You can't just shift a whole lifetime of experiences that have impacted you within like a year's time. So. Yeah, which is nuts. What are some of the things like that you'd actually recommend in terms of, I'm just trying to think like, like for myself and for people who are listening is like, what is some of the things that you like either exercises or tools or resources or books that you have read that you've been like, oh my gosh, this is really good. This is super impactful. I actually took away something from this and I applied it into this relationship and it's worked. Like some part of this has worked or it hasn't worked, but because it hasn't worked, you've been like, well, let's not do that anymore. <laughs> like whatever it is, if you got any like tools or resources that you could uh, suggest for people to actually, like if someone's listening to this podcast and they're like, oh, I want to actually go do something that's going to improve this. Like what would you suggest them to do? I think I, I think the, the biggest thing is being just able to understand your partner and yeah. understanding yourself and why they are, you know, why they are without taking things personally, right? Like if you're still taking a lot of the ways that your partner goes about things personally, it just signifies like a lot of times you, you, you both lack a lot of understanding around them or around yourself. Um, so much of Esther Perel's stuff um, has been able to, normalize and and not make as make a lot of the ways of which maybe we both were in certain ways um you know this this monster or this this demon or this like thing that needs to be you know shamed into the darkness and the fact that you know you're able to see that you're not the like it's consistent when you read things that are like or hear things from people that don't know you. They've never heard your story, but they're talking in reference to something else. And you hear them, you're like, oh my God, this person is describing me. I've had that at times with like uh, Dr. Uh, John Martini. I think he's just like being able to articulate things in a way where, it, you know, it's like put order into the chaos of which I'm trying to describe things. Um, but um, I think, uh, I think a lot of Esther Perel's work has been hugely beneficial for me, mating in captivity. Um, even her book around um, infidelity. I've not been someone who's cheated, but a lot of people have been involved in cheating and um, or have been cheated on or um, feeling betrayed. And obviously I, I read that and there's a lot of things within that. I've read um, books um, to open my perspective um, in terms of like um, non-monogamy and polyamory, even though I'm in a you know a monogamous relationship, it just challenges your perception. Uh, sorry, it just challenges your perception, right? It just opens up a couple of doors. You're just like, whoa, yeah. that's completely different. Yeah, yeah. And there's been other books. There's been other books that have like done that, and like um, the Righteous Mind: uh, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. That's broadened my um, relationship to morality um, to be less righteous in a lot of ways. So in that way, it broadened it. Reading a book like um, The Ethical Slut um, provided a lot of alternative ideas that not necessarily I needed to adopt, but allowed more openness um, in terms of the ways that people go about things and why, and then maybe understanding a little bit more about why, like I have certain things that go on within inside myself. And again, normalizing it. I think when we, we, when, you know, our partners and everything are able to not take, you know, not see things as much as, and again, that's taking responsibility. There's been so many things in the relationship or, or with me that I, I take responsibility for, right um and she ultimately takes responsibility for it as well mm. so um like what do you have any examples think, on the top of your head um well again yeah i mean for well just in terms of like you know with our intimacy stuff um i've always really reaffirmed to her like it's it, like, and it's, and you can say it to you blue in the face, 
you know, it's, it's not you. Like I've faced this before seven years ago. I didn't realize it was a pattern until I got into another relationship with you. Now I'm starting to realize that it wasn't just yeah. something that was confined to my past relationship. Yeah. Right. So then that was like, okay, well, this shit has reared its head, you know, eight years on from being very similar to my last relationship. And now I'm like, okay, well, this is still here seven years on. You obviously paid no attention to it because it's not <laughs> been in your face. It's like, you don't know you're a noisy eater until you've got someone sitting across from you, right? So <laughs> I, I then just took responsibility for being like, hey, look, this is actually a pattern. Um, I've seen it before. I, I thought it might've just been confined to this, but it's not, I've taken it with me. And you're a completely different person. I take responsibility for this, right? There's not a part of me that wants you to receive this as anything to do with you. It's like, I, I, I work on this now here with you or I, or it happen, has to happen at some point, has to happen later. So um, just taking responsibility for that. And I think my what, really wanting to and really wanting to understand why I was the way I was and why I behaved the way I behaved um, was signified in my curiosity. And when I found, found things, I'd send them to her and be like, oh, this describes me. And I didn't have like this, this like, sh like I didn't create shame and guilt around it. Yeah. And I think that's what helped um, be able to open the lines of communication is that that's I was able to, to, I was just able to, to look at myself as, as an, as an observer. Yeah. And as if I was looking upon someone that was separate to myself, where I could kind of treat it as like more of like a, you know, just objectively, trying to find answers and not not being so heavily connected to it as like you know having shame or guilt or like oh is this yeah. weird thing like, yeah for everyone who's listening and, that is an absolute nugget talking about that in terms of not having shame and guilt around something like just as a personal example i remember with um my, one of my ex-girlfriends is <laughs> i i would be i'd play the victim or i'd be quite demanding about something and i'd be super unconscious about it and then she'd be like, stop doing that. That comes from your mom. Like you got to pick that quality up from your mom and that comes from you. And then like, I remember being like, ah, oh, it does, but I can't not do it. Come on. And then like in other relationships that I've had, when that has fl flared up within myself, I've been like, oh, this is that thing that got port like pointed out from my ex that I've now reflected on. And when I, something comes up and I do something immediately, I'll catch it. And I'll say <laughs> to, to any of the, like, the other partners that I have had, I'll, I'll say to them, I'll be like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that is this conditioning that's come from my mom. I'm actually working on it. And I didn't mean to be like that just now. And they're like, Oh no, I totally get it. Like, that's fine. And not having the shame and guilt around that of like hiding it, just being like open, like, yep, this is one thing bad trait I took from a parent. I've got plenty of other good traits from them as well, but that was a bad one. Um, it's been worked out really well for me personally. So thanks for saying that. Did you, man, because did you share that with her? Did you, were you, did you say that to her? Like, Hey, look, I've just, like, I've learned this about myself and everything. Like, Oh yeah. So we, this of, is the thing. And this yeah. is again, like a lot of people don't realize they're doing this right. But if you've, if you've done that and, um, and again, like every, people say things in the heat of the moment, like, like it's, it's, it's less about like how, you know, your fight and more about like what you do after the fight. Yeah. Right. But again, like sometimes men um, don't want to open it up because in the past they've had the opening up be weaponized against them. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So and true. Again, like, Withdraw. <laughs> well, well, again, it's like, I like to, I like to get on the front foot. If someone's going to like, if I've called myself on stuff, I've found stuff to do with myself first. Like, again, like that's a part of me that doesn't want to be called out. So, like, I'm going to find it before you find it. Yeah. Right. But like, if I discover something and then you go, that's just your no, no, no again. It's like, hang on, I'm the one that's like, like I brought that to the, like, this is not nothing that we haven't spoken about before or said before, but, um, again, when men are like are able to kind of ha have these conversations, it's like, you can't. And, and there was times again, like, and I give us, I'll give a circumstance where, where the communication, I'll give a specific now. Um, you know, there was times where we'd sit down and I, I start to open up about things and I'd reach a crescendo of like, like there was a certain amount of time where I started to, it started to become like, I felt like I was being pushed. Right. And um, 
my and she would it get to a point where my opening up would lead to like an argument consistently mm. and we had to get to a point where it's like i i expressed to her pal i don't want to have negative connotations um around opening up if every time i open up and we get into an argument i'm going to have the connotation that this is ultimately going to lead to an argument and i'm going to want to do it less so we needed to be able to find a way like i we had to obviously pinpoint that and she's like yeah so we had to get to the point where we're sharing things if it, like once i reached my sort of like just beyond my edge where maybe it start, started start become unhealthy i wanted to be able to to nurture a positive connotation to me being able to have those um conversations um because the more that they led to that the less the less i actually wanted to because the connotation was just like it didn't have a positive connotation but it was up to me obviously to be able to go and reframe it and to create a framework and create a structure for us to be aware of um for us to have it lead to positive outcomes and again like with um with some people's sanctity like emotionally or physically some people when they would feel like they're pushed like or um open up before they're ready that it makes them feel slightly cheapened it's some some for some people being like hey look just open up to me it's okay to be vulnerable it's okay to be this before they're ready and, and sort of moving them into it can sometimes feel like the equivalent to some people of like hey look open your legs up to me sex is fine like whatever before they're ready is there anything wrong with opening up absolutely not is there anything wrong with sex no but does do people feel slightly cheapened by it when they do it before they're ready to do it yeah so I, I think a lot of times again a lot of people are trying to like push people into being vulnerable or like it's okay to be vulnerable it's the same sometimes it just it could represent the same it's okay to have sex yeah but i'm not ready yeah i don't have enough trust here yet i'm not like and again it's like then it's like nurturing the relationship to a point where that comfortable level starts to be bridged out more to the point where the person wants to wants to step into it because you know they're 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 ready yeah you know yeah. obviously they're not the same thing obviously one's a, a very different breach yeah. of um like you personal know, rules person, yeah i, I get the rights, analogy absolutely. Yeah. like on a yeah. they're on a different spectrum yeah for sure yeah. absolutely I get the analogy um, very yin yeah. and yang, very yin and, yang. and I, I, th I think it's very important for like uh, I, I find it very yin and yang especially for men in particular because a lot of men will distract themselves with having like sex, but then emotionally, when it comes to open up, they'll be like, hell no, nah, as you were mentioning like beforehand. So I think that's like a, a great point just to put there as you were singing. I was like, oh God, that's like really good. No. I realized it wasn't even about sex. Like, <laughs> like it wasn't even about the act. Yeah. It wasn't even about the act. Yeah. It was just like, a, it was just a sense of pseudo self-worth. It was just like, if I can have, if I can have a number of people open themselves to me in such a vulnerable way, that just validates um, my worth more. And I was just left very, I felt just a lot of, after, after a lot of sex, I was just very, I just felt a lot of guilt. It's like this, you know, you maybe experienced it, like the light switch goes off and it's like, you're just a fucking different person. It's like, you've just, your consciousness is just regained. You're like, what the fuck am I doing? And it's like, and, but you, then you'll go and do it again the next night. And she's like, well, I, like, I'm not in control here. It's like, I'm not in control here. I didn't even uh, like, and it gets to that point where you're like, oh fuck, maybe I'm like, again, I'm not in control of this. And some unconscious aspect of me is governing this behavior. And you start to be curious around that. And again, it's just like, I, I think it was just like the, the courting process and the, and the, and the, the hunt and all these things that may be a little bit, you know, obviously primal. Um, but again, I think it was just creating a pseudo sense of self-worth that maybe I was, I was lacking somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed sex. I never felt the need to gloat about it or tell anyone about it. But just in terms of looking at it for myself, I was just like, yeah, it wasn't really, a, it wasn't really about that. It was about something else, but that's just what I was using. I do that with food, man. 
a lot of people, a lot of people do. A lot of people do that. Yeah, there's a lot That's of ways completely... that you end up unconscious for for doing things, and the next minute you've gone, ah, what was I doing? <laughs> Well, that's the tough thing. The, the tough thing about food, and like again, it's hard to compare like alcoholism and and food because it's like like alcoholism is not like a necessity. But the the hard thing with when your relationship is in terms of food is the fact that it's a necessity and it's always going to have to be a part of your life. You know, like even the moment, even the small like if a if an alcoholic has one sip of you know alcohol, it can allow them to completely you know unravel. But when you can't, if you've got issues with food, it's like, you, it's not that you can just go and just go cold turkey. It has to be prevalent within your life forever. So, I mean, again, one's a, one, one's a process issue and, and the other's a, you know, a, an actual, uh, you know, a, a substance thing, actual thing. So they're, they're, they're similar in some ways, uh, uses, but not in terms of the way that you have to heal around them. Yeah. And that can be the, di- that can be the difficult thing because you can't just eradicate food from your life. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, you could for a day, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I fast. And again, like, this is the other thing. It's like, it's developing, like, uh, like even with something just around like fasting, right? Like I'm a, I, 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 um, I personally have incorporated fasting for for nine years. You have people scream blow in the face that it will lead to eating disorders. I'm a not almost 90 kilogram man that has a fine relationship with it. It's the same as like if everything needs context and everything requires intention. And it's like um, a knife can be used at a joyful occasion to cut a birthday cake, but it can also be used to kill someone. <laughs> yeah. It's like... Right. So uh, when, 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 again, like th- this is the sneakiness of like, of, um, of lack of context or, uh, you know, not looking at intentionality or people's relationship to things. It's rarely ever the food. It's rarely ever the body. It's rarely ever the thing. It's your relationship to it that needs looking at. It's again, some people can have a really comfortable and healthy relationship with fasting. Like myself, we've proven that to be the case. Some people can have a really healthy relationship with counting calories. That it can be the case. Some people can have a really healthy relationship with looking at the scale every day and it hasn't, doesn't affect their um, self-worth. Is it the things themselves? No, it's the relationship and your processes around them that ultimately will dictate the, the relationship you have and the health around it. So yep. um, it's discovering those things. It doesn't necessarily mean that people need to go and do those things. But again, when we blame these things as being the source, you are distracting yourself from actually finding the source. Yeah. And that, that's the big reason as to why, I, you know, like can those things, can a knife kill? Yeah. Can, I, can fasting lead to that? Yeah, it could. Depends on your processes. Depends on your past. Depends on yeah. your life. Depends on a whole bunch of things. Yeah. But is it the, the, yeah. the main indicator of how you will use it? The knife didn't make that person stab that person. <laughs> yeah, right? Man. And the source is, so, isn't a ketchup bottle, man. It's always something within you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. what, what would because uh, what i think is just like crazy man is that there is i think just to be like simply be aware of and yes it does take up a little bit of brain power if you're like oh god there's so much to learn here is that you, you've got a relationship with god damn everything like <laughs> you have a relationship mm-hmm. with there's so much different stuff that you're actually in a relationship with and understanding your relationship with the different things and if they're healthy and if they're not and like which ones do you pursue which ones do you not pursue which ones are improving the quality of life which ones aren't which ones do you need to work on um is extremely important to know and i th- i think that doing relationship work with your partner is extremely important because that is like I think one of the hardest relationships that you can work on and like the most rewarding yin and yang obviously is going to be like the most work, but it's obviously going to be the most rewarding and the better that you can improve that relationship, the better you can improve business relationships, friend relationships, your relationships with food, your relationships with other things, purely because you're just learning all of these techniques and skills and self-reflection within yourself and someone else, which is like so ridiculously powerful so i think that's pretty legit oh for sure i mean when people yeah. uh, like when people if they've got distorted eating patterns if they can unlock that and form a healthy relationship with that that can unlock like 
so many areas like i'm like creating this creating this course right now i'm like yeah it's 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 like it's so much more than that and it filters into so many other in, in into other areas of of people's lives and that's why like i'm really passionate about this because again it's just like um just and again like developing obviously more of people's intuition to things is 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 huge i mean even for a lot of women like maybe that maybe it's not maybe it's just like they need to live it more in the develop a release of their feminine more and and that's what unlocks things and maybe that's not an area that they thought was indicative of the relationship they have and it's like little things like that that once realized can go a long way to then you know re relaying that back into your relationship to your business into a relationship with your related like into your relationships so i mean again like a big part of me is being is 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 paying attention to to a lot of the you know the eight different aspects of of well-being and consistently looking at where i'm at and where sometimes like my social health has dropped and that's okay for a minute for a period of time and then then i go and try to nourish it i mean it's very hard to obviously have all eight areas of your life like being lifted up at the same time some things have to take priority you know it's very hard to go and have balance especially when it comes to growth it's like you can have harmony but balance is almost impossible right so um you know the simple things like being connected into nature like i notice when i'm not how i feel if i spend too much time in front of the computer i know i know how i feel i pay attention and again with a lot of this stuff it's just allowing people to pay more attention it's like how do i get you to pay more attention to things that are just slipping through the cracks and if you start to pay more attention you have more self-awareness the sky's the limit Dude, you know so so, so so important well before we go and wrap it up man i've got one question if someone is at that stage of their life where they've had some success they've been kicking some goals and one of the things that they really want to work on is their relationship and they're like cool i really want to work on this relationship to develop in other areas what are just a couple of things that you would suggest them to do like this week next week that they could take away and um leave with and give a crack in terms of okay so a uh, people that have had success in a number of a number of ways of their life yep um, business wise, like, but, yep. but relationships Body, may finance. not be yep. huge value, Yep. but they're, but they're wanting it to be, but they're wanting it to be. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the, the thing is, is that like our, our true values will rise to the surface. They have, they have to, it's just a matter or not of whether or not we, um, respect them or ignore, uh, or ignore them, uh, if, and if we judge them. Because yeah. sometimes there's people that have high values that they judge and they don't want it to be the case. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it is. It is of high value. I mean, sometimes when I ask people, you know, like, what's the reason you don't think your health is where it is? And I, and I give them a whole list of things. But majority of the time, it's just purely not a value. I, like, I don't know enough or I don't have the time. It's purely down to a value thing. Like, so, but know. then they judge it. They go, no, it is a huge value. It might, it might be maybe top five, but it's definitely not top two. I'm telling you right now. So if people do decide that they value it, you'll see that represented in their, in their behavior. Um, if it's not, you won't, you won't see it represented within their behavior. Yeah. So um, again, it's like, show me a life and, uh, and it will tell me your values. And um, so for people that are really wanting to that, they've obviously got to understand and know why it is they want it like and is there anything that has been there like if someone's been a workaholic and they've succeeded because, and again this is the hard thing with a lot of cruxes is that some are more socially acceptable and this is why people don't go to work to improve them because we can we can glorify hard workers and we can glorify men that are capable of having sex with a lot of people and when it's sometimes more socially acceptable we don't go to work to realize like realize if if it's actually just a medicator that we're and maybe some people have come have come to that point where they realize fuck i'm successful yeah but i'm a workaholic because xyz 
And unless you start to unravel those things and start to have a real look at it and start to read up, start to watch videos, get mentor, seek it out, be curious. And again, when I talk to people, I'm like, what's the number one trait that I, I think will allow you to become successful in any, any area of your life? And they rattle off a whole bunch of things. It's always going to be curiosity. If you maintain a curiosity around a certain topic, it signifies that you actually, that there's a value around it. You can't not be, you can't not be. So I think when people maintain a level of curiosity and that's, and it's tireless, you'll, you'll find, you'll, you'll find answers. They may be, they might not come as thick and fast as you'd like them to. You got to not be frustrated about, by that. Um, but it, 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 all, it, all, it that's a question to obviously ask. Um, but again, it's just, curiosity is just, a, is, is the main thing. Go and seek out people, go and seek out help. And again, for people that are, have been hyper successful, there's a part of their identity that's probably like, I work things out. Um, I can do things by myself. And they create that identity. You might have to drop that and be like, help. I am someone that is capable of doing these things by myself. But I also would like to identify as someone that's not too proud to ask for help. Yeah. Right. Where it's not, it's not a battle against both. It's like, I can, I can have both. I can eat my cake and still be super fit. Right. It's like, I can be someone that's independent, but I can also be someone that is able to help um, to ask for help in, in areas that maybe I don't excel in. And that's going to be able to fast pace it. Again, that's a big problem that a lot of people have that the hyper that are really successful is that it gets to a point where their identity is like, I've worked things out in this realm. I can do it in this realm. And it's like, go and seek mentorship, go and seek, you know, outside sources. I've had to do that. I've had this, like, I've had a lot of answers in a lot of ways, but in the ways that have been the most hard to move, I've needed people who specialize in it, get mentorship, you know? And again, where do I get mentorship? If you value it, your curiosity will go and find it. Yeah. It just will. Yeah. It yeah. just will. Yeah. Right. Wise words, man. That was honestly so, so beautiful. And, so true. So if anyone's listening, um, like obviously you've got some mentorship available and stuff. And like if people are interested, man, where can they find you? Uh, so I mainly am on Instagram uh, at underscore underscore Ben James underscore. I know it's not the it's not the best for brand. Ben Kelly. I was, <laughs> I was slow oh, to I was slow to party on Instagram. So all the all the Ben Jameses were taken up. So <laughs> I had to throw in some underscores there. So yeah. underscore underscore Ben James underscore. Um, that's where you can find me. Yeah. Um, the most easiest and then where I where I kind of play the most. Awesome. Well man, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I thought we got in some like awesome stuff there. I can't wait to re-listen to it again. And like thanks for being just such a sick dude, man. And and you know, choosing to live the best life possible and working on yourself and being a guy that is, you know, capable of getting vulnerable. So extremely good talking to you, man. Trying, bro, trying. Thanks, Corey, for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. I know I know how important um you know, this work is to you and other, you know, the types of people you surround yourself are really incredible people. So, um, you know, you having me on to speak to your audience, uh, I really appreciate uh, and value. So thank you. Oh man. Thank you.